This lecture is titled Critical Reading of Important Writers. This lecture is divided into two parts, reading as a writer and stages of the writing process. We keep a sharp eye on the processes and therefore, we would like to draw your attention to the stages of the writing process and what the implications of that term are. In the second part, we look at Margaret Atwood, the great Canadian writer, her autobiographical post-colonial perspective, her point of view about the modern writer's equivocal sense and also thereby the writer's double, the double within. That is a very, very different position from the position of Albert Camus and therefore, let us also go over some of the ground that we covered last time when we indicated that the reading of the journals of writers and artists is very useful in helping you develop your own writing work. And in addition to Albert Camus example, which is not covered in by the writer's workbook, you can look at other examples that they have chosen, but I quite like what they have to say about the writer's journals because they, this statement captures the unique value of this genre. According to the writer's journal write-up, the greatest writer's diaries are marked by their dedication to the craft of writing and also by their emotional honesty. So, that is a very important uh, outlook and there are many, many examples that you can explore and see which one suits you most. Camus of course, had pointed out in the Carnets that these were literary notebooks and he made an attempt to work out a separation between autobiographical writing and fictional crystallization of experience, observations, themes. But of course, you know all what can say is that these are attempts because it is a very difficult thing to separate out these kinds of ideas. But you see these signposts, that is the term we had used last time. And the other point that perhaps will become very important as we go along is related to the notations in Carnets regarding the constant engagement of self with self. Camus says in Carnets, I do not know what I could wish for rather than this continued presence of self with self. As I said, this is a very important outlook and sure enough, we really will have to problematize it because Atwood's point of view is entirely different. And therefore, when we investigate these writers as we have indicated earlier, these are prescribed texts, but they are not prescriptive in any way because I think creativity really demands that you explore ideas with a sense of provisionality and a sense of independence. At the same time, you have to learn to examine ideas of a particular writer from his or her own point of view. Interlinked reading was another concept that we introduced you to. This is not really in some ways a very unusual concept, but the reason we devised this term interlinked reading is related to writer's journals along with the writer's literary work discovering points of contact between the two and this in particular helps you get a glimpse into first person narrative and fictional distancing. You can see that whole process unfold and it also helps you position your own writing. I may quite remind you of module 1 where Salman Rishdi had talked about Midnight's children and how he was uh, really, uh, he felt like he did not really have a sort of feel for a form that would suit him till he actually discovered the first person point of view and also related issues. Camus too has talked about 
these issues, but I think what uh, will be very useful for you right now is to understand it textually. So, you can read the outsider and you can see how uh, you know Camus has tried to deal with it. So, you get a glimpse into first person narrative and also fictional distancing and you learn to interpret the view of the world presented or implied in the work. There is a useful statement that Paul Dawson has made with reference to composition, which is a result of this reading process and I like to place that observation before you. He says, recreate the process of composition as if you were the writer. The student writer's focus should be on the choices authors considered when composing. Writing students need to become active readers to study the point of view, the tone, the plotting and other techniques that the authors employ. What caught my attention was this phrase as if that he has used, a phrase that later on in the third module you will discover again because Stanislavski, the great teacher of acting, he posed that as a basic device of getting into the world view of the character, the actor and character sort of dynamics which requires transformation and sense of the other. And in that sense, I think this is a very interesting outlook. Uh, also, the element of magic you can add here. So, you can magically become a particular writer and try and examine the world from the point of view of this writer. But in any case, whatever you read, whichever way you want to apply it for composition, this exercise of interlinked reading will certainly help you understand form and content much better. In the creativity and creative writing course, there were certain assumptions regarding this process that we made. Our video course also assumes a sort of some kind of preliminary exposure to introductory literature courses which provide the experience of reading and interpretation of significant milestones of literature. So, we take it that you are already used to certain amount of sustained close reading, but at the same time now we would like you to modify your you know approach to reading and read for your own composition. So, that sort of it puts different demands on you. For creative composition, we encourage our students to try out their own independent writing project. At the same time, analysis of the impulse to write should be undertaken to generate momentum for writing. It should not be just a sort of purely spontaneous thing. I think analysis really helps you sustain that work better, understand your own a consciousness better. So, that is also a process of search that we have uh, you know emphasized earlier and we would like to remind you that th this is where we are located. So, this interlinked reading helps you understand certain aspects of literary composition. For example, in fictional or dramatic creations you have character who is imagined by the writer. For example, Albert Camus imagined Mursault, that is he created Mursault the character and the feelings and thoughts of this character are presented in first person uh, point of view through the first person narrative technique. Point of view is a lens through which the connection with the reader is established. So, you have first person point of view, third person point of view, limited or omniscient. You have dialogue which drives the action, it reveals or conceals the motivations of a character. For example, the character of Muir Salt does not reveal his inner agony or his inner sense of void 
through explicit statements, you have to infer it. In fact, many of the dialogues hide or complicate this sense, inner sense of mere salt. So, dialogue does not necessarily add to understanding of the character, sometimes it is actually a way of concealing and complicating the inner world of the character. The plot consists of series of events with a beginning, middle and end. Voice brings all the elements of writing together in a distinctive manner. So, I, I would say that we have really given primacy to the process of writing and this preliminary understanding is absolutely necessary for further development of writing. Although it is fruitful to read writers notebooks and essays on writing with the individual writers creative work, but in a departure from tra traditional literary approach we have given primacy to writing oriented uh, texts by significant writers. The qualities of the chosen writers imagination can be critiqued we feel only after reading some of their significant work. It is beneficial also to deal with philosophical or theoretical implications of their ideas. You can try and locate the qualities of the specific writers imagination within the metaphors referred to in our first module lecture 10. Now, let me explain that a little bit to you. When we talk about the imagination of the writer, we certainly are using the word imagination in number of different ways, but at this point in time I would like you to look at some of the enabling metaphors that were referred to earlier. We had suggested at that time that you could start thinking about it, about those concepts and ideas. Today, we will explain those ideas in some detail, although we will at the same time leave them open ended, so that you can place Camus and Atwood in your own way and you can also continue to use those metaphors in order to generate both creative and critical analysis. So, the idea that we had mentioned related to imagination was related to imagination as a mirror. This is from Rob Pope's book, where in turn he has referred to Kearney's conception of creative imagination as a refinement of M. H. Abraham's The Mirror and the Lamp. So, these three metaphors are imagination as a mirror, which he describes as mimetic, reflectionist or representational model, imagination as a lamp, which is an expressivist, generative or affective model and imagination as a labyrinth of looking glasses and this metaphor is self-referential meta textual or virtual simulacrum model. Now, some of the terms may confuse you, but we will explain them uh, you know little by little. So, we this is right now like a building block for your discussion and for your consideration. Uh, this as we indicated derives from Kearney's model and he in turn has based this model on the ideas of creativity. So, he is concerned with creativity in the western culture. According to him western culture is a uh, civilization of the image. Kearney himself is a philosopher of narrative imagination, hermeneutics and phenomenology and his main concern in this book, I think it is called the wake of imagination it seems to be to analyze the threat to the human imagination posed by the onslaught of the media. As he says, one can no longer be sure who is actually making our images, a creative human subject or some anonymous system of reproduction. So, there is a lot of uh, stress, a lot of uh, tension around traditional modes of critiquing the human imagination because the modes 
of making images itself has undergone such radical transformation. So, this is just to give you a sense of where these ideas come, fr uh, come from and I think Kearney has sort of argued that we need to revisit the older metaphors and what they offer to us by way of finding our own bearings in contemporary uh, very complex setup. Uh, so, the three metaphors are placed historically to show their differences and contemporary possibilities. Each is built around this enabling metaphor and it may be used to model a particular kind of imagination as well as a specific historical stage. The three historical stages one can say are classical and actually I am quoting from Rob Pope, classical and early modern so far as the metaphor of the mirror is concerned. It evokes this period and this uh, the practice, the dominant practice of this period. Romantic and post romantic is linked to the image of a lamb and modern and postmodern is you know linked to a labyrinth of looking glasses. So, with that open ended sort of possibility, uh, we would now shift our attention to Margaret Atwood, where the notion of the self is problematized in entirely different ways. But let us see who Margaret Atwood is and how she has articulated these issues in the book we have chosen. Uh, this is based on classroom reading of selected chapters of her book Negotiating with the Dead, a writer on writing. Margaret Atwood is a marvelous presence and uh, is a highly engaged writer. She is a Canadian poet, novelist, literary critic, essayist and environmental activist. We would like you to uh, go to her website where she has very generous comments and resources that she has offered for young writers. She also has uh, her take on lots of issues that are placed there very methodically. Uh, in addition to that, uh, she has, we have picked up one or two remarks from this website where she says that currently she is immersed in the final draft of other worlds, science fiction and the human imagination. Now, to me personally, this is a matter of uh, great uh, interest because I deal uh, in my research work with uh, cultural narratives and constructs around the notion of science, the you know constant shifts and balances and changes that these cultural narratives display. Uh, and I was I remember quite amazed that she rejected the term science fiction very vociferously earlier by labeling her fiction as speculative fiction. So, I, I would be really, really very interested in looking at her observations. Margaret Atwood has been deeply engaged with the imperialist political system, if we may describe it that way, that define the economics and politics of globalization. And what she seems to have done is to look at the dark shadows of these systems, both through her fiction and through her non-fiction. You can read more of her to discover this in greater depth. Her writing is highly evocative and evocative in the sense one associates that term with feminine uh, humanistic consciousness. That is, uh, I think there is a very unique vantage point from which she looks at the systems that have been constructed over centuries. To quote from her novel Lady Oracle, she creates gothic gone wrong, very provocative indeed. These are uh, the book, the particular book that we have chosen. These are series of six Empson lectures uh, that she uh, gave at the University of Cambridge in the year 2000 and it was delivered to an audience of students, scholars and the general public. As we said uh, earlier also, I pointed it out earlier. 
this deals with the process of writing and its products. The book is intended for writers at an early stage of their writing career, that is what she has mentioned time and again, although I think it has relevance for other writers at a mature level of their writing career. Also, it is very interesting observation of the writer's processes. The title refers to the influence of previous generations of writers, the dead writers, but also the influence that their writing exerts and also uh, one's relationship with one's ancestors. I think she refers to that in a very large sense of that term. The introduction is titled Into the Labyrinth. Uh, you remember in terms of the enabling metaphors, this was the addition uh, that uh, Kearney made uh, in the labyrinth. But in any case, there are no looking glasses that she mentions here, but she talks about writing as a struggle or path or journey into the dark to illuminate it. I would recommend that you look at the YouTube short piece on Atwood's creative process to get a feel for this idea. The idea itself otherwise will seem very daunting if you read the full introduction, but certainly in terms of this uh, basic outlook, this is like taking a leap in, in the, into the, the uh, dark areas of human consciousness and trying to, in order to retrieve light at the end of it. The first chapter of this book is autobiographical and it deals with the writer's struggles for her voice with a mixture of post-colonial and post-modern concerns. Now, we have placed these two terms here and we have used this terminology earlier too. I wanted to ensure that we are on the same page and therefore, I have tried to give a simple definition of the two terms. Post-colonial is related to colonization and its, shall we say, uh, insidious consequences on the thought processes of the colonized. Postmodern refers to all the previous certainties and definitions that uh, you know writing and thought, thought and knowledge systems after the modern period have questioned. This term is sometimes used in a sort of chronological sense in order to show a sharp division between modern and what happened after the, um, modernism reached its peak. It is uh, seen also with reference to the two world wars and the post world war two phenomenon that unfolded. I think the best uh, introductory guide is provided by the Cambridge book of postmodernism in which not only literature, drama, fiction, poetry, but also all the other uh, branches of knowledge are put together in order to show the postmodern direction in the work uh, in engineering, science, architecture, etc. So, it is a very uh, sort of broad term, but certainly what it denotes is a questioning of previously uh, widely held definitions in different fields of knowledge and human endeavor. So far as writing is concerned in postmodernism, the form of writing itself is viewed ironically. So, nothing is taken for granted in other words. Margaret Atwood herself describes her experimentation with different forms and also the acute sense of marginalization of Canadian literature that she experienced and others like her experienced. And in her process of search, Fry's statement during her university days had a revolutionary impact on her where uh, Nothropo Fry mentioned that the center of reality is wherever one happens to be and its circumference is whatever one's imagination can make sense of. In other words, uh, you know the post colonial in the post colonial situation since Canada was also a colony. Uh, you know, there was always this sense that nothing important happened there. Everything happened 
uh, everything that was important and culturally valuable happened in metropolitan centers elsewhere. And therefore, this was a sort of with a shock of recognition, many writers in that period realized that their own lives really needed articulation in a totally different way and they need not look at models outside in an imitative mold. So, this was a very key uh, point of growth as far as my understanding goes. This is where she locates her change of consciousness and her increased confidence as a writer. There is according to her one characteristic that sets writing apart from most of the other arts and I thought I would place this idea before you because apart from this idea about the post-colonial consciousness and its struggles, internal struggle, struggles in order to find one's own authentic voice, I think the other idea that she mentions is about, uh, related to the democratic elements of writing and let me read this. There is one characteristic that sets writing apart from most of the other arts. It is apparent democracy by which I mean its availability to almost everyone as a medium of expression. Although this seems to be definitely a very important observation and at the same time immediately one's feeling was that uh, this does not really take into account the non-literates, uh, their oral traditions and also cultures of silence which are actually uh, not all that silent, but they are, uh, they are perceived as silent because they are not linked to literacy and power. But this is just a very strong uh, response to her observation, but certainly within the parameters of literate cultures, this is an important idea because writing does not demand anything but one's own sort of sense of the self and one's ability to express one's ideas in any language form that one wants. The second chapter deals with the post romantic writers double consciousness and I paused here because now this is a slightly different kind of take on the writing process and she locates this sense of the writers double consciousness to certain lingering uh, you know sort uh, effects of romantic movement. So, let us see how this can be understood. We thought that the best way would be to look at a second chapter which is titled duplicity, the Jekyll hand, the Hyde hand and the slippery double, why there are always two. So, remember she is talking about a writer's you know sense of doubleness and she links it to a certain amount of uncertainty about the writer's own craft and art. She calls it the equivocal sense view of the self, there is certain uncertainty about it. Now, let us see how she develops this idea. The lineage of the romantics of course, has already has been mentioned in my last slide itself. According to her, the romantics fixed doubleness in the popular consciousness as a thing to be expected and expected above all of artists. On the same page, she goes on to say that the secret identities and powers of the artists were constantly referred to in different ways by the romantics. According to this take, it is the artists who possess the secret identities, the secret powers. So, they are very special people with secret identities and secret powers and therefore, they have access to knowledge, they have access to insights that really others have lost touch with, them in their garrets starving and creating works of genius. So, they also strive to be in touch with these secret identities and these secret powers 
in their garrets starving and creating works. And we suggest that you have a look at the opera La Boheme to decipher the recurrence of this romantic notion. Uh, Puccini's La Boheme Act 1 title, The Four Bohemians uh, Garret in particular is highly recommended. I think this you, it will immediately give you a sense of what this whole metaphor is all about. All right now, the notion of the writer's double is was also influenced according to Atwood by the romantics fascination for folk stories and folklore. Old stories about the doppelganger and the motif of twins and doubles in mythologies. So far as the term romanticism is concerned, it covers mid 18th and early 20th centuries practice and it really is used in wide variety of uh, ways, but we will restrict ourselves to whatever Atwood has to say. In this choice of the doppelganger theme and the conventions of gothic literature, one can discern certain amount of ambivalence. On the one hand a sense of the secret power, but also there are other elements of certain kind of ambivalence that you begin to discern and that is why we would like you to also look at the term gothic here, which refers to a form of artistic expression that focuses on what is mysterious and beyond the realm of human control. So, this is uh, in the beginning uh, Atwood talked about writing uh, you know by calling it in the labyrinth. I think that sense will be captured better when you have the sense of the gothic. The narratives that Atwood has selected are those of the sinister double. So, this is the notion of the double and the double within, but she also looks at number of sort of varieties or number of references that uh, we would like you to look at also. The sinister double for example, Jekyll and Hyde, which of course, uh, you know in, in this novel refers to the tale of an earnest physician leading a double life partly as himself and partly as a fanged madcap. So, this sense of the double within, is it sinister or is it uh, helpful? So, that is the question I think that she is trying to articulate by also pointing out how this whole plot unfolds if you look at it thematically. The noble double for example, is another option here, uh, which she refers to uh, through brothers Grimm's folk tale, the gold children, in which through twists and turns of fortune, the gold child is saved by his twin. So, that is a helpful uh, twin, the helpful other, if you are loc locating these stories within the notion of the double within. The double within uh, she emphasizes through the story of Narcissus and Borges and I by uh, the great Argentine writer. The Narcissus myth is the myth of self love, which torments Narcissus leading to his annihilation. We will uh, place these stories before you in the next lecture and we will also show you the response of our students to these through their creative composition. Uh, Borges refers to uh, this intriguing and unresolvable connection between the protean self and the writer's persona. So, there is basically this sense of the split that Margaret Atwood ascribes to the romantics, their impact and also the doppelganger theme that she explores uh, almost as a sort of uh, a romantic writer, but of course, she is trying to understand where this contemporary uh, implication of the double within comes from. According to her, the double within is more than a twin or sibling. He or she is you, a you who shares your most essential features, your appearance, your voice, even your name and in traditional societies such doubles were usually bad luck. Now, 
our take is that there are certain unstated connections that one can one discerns in this articulation of Atwoods, where the female gothic seems to be a looming presence in her consciousness, although she has not really developed that idea in the this essay at all. Uh, and this is I think a result of our interlinked readings. There, they, she all also seems to sort of uh, locate the ambivalence in anxieties of creation, whether it is artistic, scientific or biological. And this take of hers of the split within is reminiscent of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and his creature, which again was a feminine romantic foray that we will uh, discuss later on textually if possible. And uh, in terms of interlinked reading, we would like to refer to Oryx and Craig, which is as we you know pointed out earlier is speculative fiction and it is a significant extension of this multifaceted creative position. Uh, to quote her essay, you know in terms of creative anxieties, writing Oryx, Oryx and Craig, she says that the, uh, as novelist Alistair MacLeod has said, writers write about what worries them and the world of Oryx and Craig worries me right now. It is not a question of our inventions. All human inventions are merely tools, but of what might be done with them. For no matter how high the tech, Homo sapiens remain at heart what he has been for tens of thousands of years, the same emotions, the same preoccupations. Oryx and Craig projects a diastopic future to warn readers about the dangers contemporary high tech has created for the human race as well as the envi environment. In the very first chapter, Snowman describes his stages of extinction in phrases such as there are a lot of blank spaces in his stub of a brain where memory used to be and so on and so forth. So, in other words, uh, I think Margaret Atwood's notion of the double is a problematic one, although she, in this particular essay she relates it to the inner uh, quest of the writer and in that sense she also locates it in terms of a kind of transformation that occurs in the process of writing, but uh, we personally feel this is a very complex idea. Uh, however, if we were to stick to this essay, she says that another reason why this equivocal sense of the writer is very, a very, very pronounced element of contemporary writer's consciousness that is perhaps related to features of writing as a form that have contributed to this syndrome, the syndrome of the writer's anxiety about this other self as well as the sus this suspicion that he has one. She feels that this is linked to the wider dissemination of printed work wherein the work gains different meanings in different contexts. To quote her, that writer and audience may be unknown to each other because the act of creation is separated in time from the act of receiving it and the infinite replicability of the book. These two factors contributed greatly to the modern writer's equivocal view of himself seems very gendered way of putting the ideas, but I think we will leave it at that. Uh, we have as usual the work cited list provided and uh, we definitely encourage you to look at it. Teaching the Gothic and the scientific context in particular, although it is a short essay, uh, I, we think it provides very interesting connections for our own generative search and we will have that for further discussion enjoy the ideas and see uh, whether Atwood helps you out understand your writing process better or it is Albert Camus or is some other writer or in the process of uh, you know being provoked by these possibilities you have found your own voice. That will be the ideal situation. We will move on to the work that our students did uh, you know with reference to Atwood in the next lecture. Thank you.